Hello from Los Briles, Baja, California, sir. Hope you're having a great day. Welcome to 30 Priceless Tips for Building or Buying the Ultimate 4x4 Adventure Van. So what kind of vehicle are we talking about? Well, we're talking about one that is all season, something that you can live in for years, and if you desire, even drive it around the world. Yeah, the list may say 30, but I guarantee you're gonna walk away with hundreds of critical thoughts before you pull any triggers or make any decisions about starting a lifestyle like this. We are Ben and Rebecca, a couple of travelers from Alaska with the dream of driving around the world with our road dog, Lucy. COVID has put a kink in our plans, so we're killing time and making the most of life in one of our favorite places. Baja, California, Mexico. These films are produced with your support, the Outliers YouTube community. Click join on our channel for early video releases, exclusive content, increased engagement, and so much more. Well, let's start this video with a few critical thoughts to get your mind straight. Overlanding, it is not about a vehicle and it is not about off-roading overlanding is about long distance long-term travel and it can be done in anything from a vespa to a vw bus to a van like ours so if you already have the vehicle that's the easy part and our suggestion is to go get in that vehicle right now like stop watching yeah. the video go now hop in your vehicle and take off uh the, the vehicle is the easy part, creating the location independence to travel in said vehicle is the challenging part. Luckily for you guys, we created a course about how to do just that. So if you're interested in learning more, check out freedomisthenewwealth.com. Okay, and then the third one of these little bonus tips is to do it while you're young. Aging sucks. I'm in my mid forties now, I can say it. Stuff starts to hurt. Um, as you get older, you accrue more debt. And then sadly, like Rebecca and I just went through this phase of grandparents passing away. So if you're in your early 20s and the stars are aligned, make it happen. Get out there and travel now. Well, when you're considering a journey like this, the best place to start is at the beginning. So your journey should dictate the kind of vehicle you choose. Who is going to travel with you 99% of the time? How many people do you need room for? Where do you want to travel to on the planet? And what do you want to do? Where do you want to get to once you get there? So do you want to stay on the paved roads? Do you want to be able to four by four down any road you find? What kind of weather are you going to encounter? Is it going to be hot or cold? Do you need to worry about heat and air conditioning? All of these things factor in. So really drive down where do you want to go? What kind of journey do you want to take in this vehicle? Number two, and we're transitioning into some uh, more logistical issues, but how do you want to live in said vehicle? Do you want to do the rooftop tent thing and live next to your vehicle? Do you want to have something like ours that is completely self-contained? Do you want to have, like we said earlier, a Vespa or even a van like a Sprinter or a Combi, got 40 Conaline one next to us, a Volkswagen one over there, but they are all compromises and you just need to figure out how do you want to live? Because there's a big difference if you're on the road for years at a time on having a completely self-contained unit or every time the weather sucks and having a rooftop tent just being able to shiver and sit out there in the rain or go crunch up in your tent because that's the only safe haven you have next up a pre-purchase vehicle inspection odds are you're not going to find the vehicle you want in your backyard it's going to be some ways away and sometimes flying out to look at it isn't feasible but Having someone put eyes on it is critical, whether it's a friend or you hire a local mechanic to go take some video and pictures and do an inspection for you, or you arrange for the buyer to do an inspection at a local mechanic and then you do video conferencing. We speak from experience on this. We actually came really close to purchasing a vehicle in the UK. 
but we had a friend who was a mechanic go out and take a look at it for us and turns out the pictures did not do it justice it had some terrible water damage had been in an accident they kind of covered up and we ended up not buying it when we bought this truck the owner had just taken it in for an inspection which we got paperwork from we did extensive video conferencing to look at it and actually ended up not flying down before we purchased it but be really wise about this when you are getting a vehicle don't buy something sight unseen okay moving on to number four the pink slip also known as the title of ownership for the vehicle if you plan on driving around the world you're not going to want to have Citibank or Bank of America or Wells Fargo's name next to yours on the title. That can just be a logistical nightmare when crossing international borders. That also being said, you know, big 4x4 adventure vehicles, they're not cheap and a lot of folks need a loan to make it happen. That's just the way the world works now. But you can take a second out on your house which is actually probably gonna get you a far better interest rate and do all that stuff. And then take that cash and invest it into a four x four adventure vehicle. And then only your name will be on the title. Number five, auto insurance. This is something you need to leave a significant portion of your budget to cover. Odds are you're going to have a vehicle that is fairly pricey, something that you're going to want to cover with more than just liability insurance. Sometimes you're gonna carry insurance in more than one country. For example, when we're in Mexico, we still maintain our US insurance. When you travel to Europe, you get your liability over in Europe and you get your comprehensive here in the States. So it can end up being a pricey co component of your budget and something that you need to think about and be planning for as you plan your route and destinations. Next up, number six, right-hand drive vehicles versus left-hand drive vehicles. Traditionally, countries like the UK or Australia are going to have right-hand drive vehicles. This was a vehicle meant for the United States, so we are left-hand drive. But what you need to consider is that where are you going to be 90% of the time? Because I would hate to be on the wrong side of the road 90% of the time. That would just be... A royal inconvenience. You also got to think that if you want to travel through Central America, the Pan American Highway, countries like Costa Rica do not let right hand drive vehicles into their country. So it can cause logistical issues as well. Number seven, parts and serviceability. These are machines. Machines have many, many working parts. Those parts eventually break. It's inevitable. So if you can find a chassis that is serviceable around the globe that you can access parts anywhere on the planet, your life will be infinitely easier. So think about companies like Mercedes or Mitsubishi Fuso. Serviceable and parts are accessible anywhere on the planet. Next up, number eight, the GVWR, Gross Vehicle Weight Rating. This is an important number that is set by the vehicle manufacturer as to what it's capable of carrying. That's just the very lay way of saying it. But the main thing you want is to leave room for your habitat, your belongings, and all of that stuff. Because you may think, oh, my engine has plenty of power. Well, yeah, you may be able to pull it, but are the brakes big enough to uh, stop it? And if you do happen to go over your GVWR and get into an accident of sorts, it's just another excuse for crooked insurance companies to deny a claim. Number nine, can you tow your sleeping habitat? And the simple answer is yes. Anything is possible with the right vehicle. And honestly, the answer to this question is an entire video in and of itself of the things you should consider. For us, we opted not to go in this direction for a few simple reasons. Number one, you make a lot of wrong turns when you are in foreign lands, and the complexities of having to back up and move about the way that you do when you're towing something just adds an element of difficulty that you don't need. Number two, you have two things to maintain, the vehicle and the tow. So you just add to the cost and complexity on that level. And number three, it's kind of silly, but to some degree a safety factor. 
anything that happens in this truck, we feel it instantly. If you're sleeping in a rig separate from your car, things can go wrong and you don't necessarily know it's happening. So it just seemed simpler to us to actually just keep things simpler and have one vehicle. Number 10, you have to figure out how much money do you want to spend? And I say that because from one of the boutique manufacturers, a four x four expedition vehicle can cost easily over half a million dollars. Granted, you're getting a very high end quality product for that price, but still it's a half a million dollars. Or you can go with the do it yourself option because the do it yourself market for building these things has come a long ways in the past decade. And the best part is that you can use some of your own logic, not somebody else's logic to build the vehicle. You can save money, but your one investment is going to be sweat equity. Another choice is to buy a vehicle used that somebody else built. That's what we did. We're the third owners of this machine. Two people both left their mark on it and they've done amazing jobs. Not to sound, you know, mean or braggy, but they did some amazing work and built us the perfect vehicle to travel in. All right, let's move on to talking about some very specific components of the vehicle and whether or not you need them. First off, four wheel drive. Is it even necessary? Two wheel drive will get you to about 90% of the places. All wheel drive will get you to 95%. Four wheel drive will get you the rest of the way. So for some people, it's probably not a necessary expense to add on and thing to maintain on your vehicle. For us, we live in Alaska, it's our home base. So being able to leave any time of the year under any weather conditions without worrying was really important to us. For you, depending on where you live and where you wanna travel, it might not be necessary. Moving on to number 12, ground clearance, approach and departure angles. Well, what is ground clearance? Plain and simple, it's how much clearance you have underneath your vehicle so you don't whack it when you drive over it. Uh, that's of great value when you're going off trail and off road. Now, approach angle, that's on the front. That's that angle right here, meaning can you drive up to a steep section and go up it without hitting your front bumper. Now you come over to the rear. So you're kind of going up that thing. Well, this is your departure angle. So you'll see like, for example, a lot of slide in truck campers have a giant big old booty that just extends out a country mile. That is great on road, but it can be limiting off road. Number 13, do it yourself maintenance and accessibility. So the question is, when you're looking at vehicles, are you going to be able to maintain it yourself? And are you going to be able to access what you need to access to maintain it yourself? You really want to do the KISS method here. Keep it simple, stupid. Stay away from really high tech computer systems. And also think about, is the engine accessible? For us, ours is a cab over, so we pop the cab up and the engine is completely accessible. There's no aspect of it that's covered by a cowling so we can't get to it without special tools. It's also very easy to maintain. We have changed all of the fluids on this rig. We can change the air filters and the fuel filters with minimal complexity or effort even. Honestly, it's super easy. And that's something that means we save a lot of money and it puts us in control of maintaining this vehicle no matter where we are in the world. Number 14, let's talk about the fuel that an engine is gonna need to run on, primarily gas or diesel. Electric vehicles, they're on their way, but it's not quite commonplace yet. So gasoline, it can be found anywhere on the planet. Diesel can be found anywhere on the planet, but the problem lies with ultra low sulfur diesel. And starting around 2007 to 2008, vehicle manufacturers started equipping vehicles to run on that type of uh, fuel and to have diesel exhaust fluid. And what it is, is it's just emission stuff. It makes for a cleaner burning engine and that's all well and good, but not all parts of the world have that fuel. So we chose a 2007 Mitsubishi Fuso chassis. No ultra low sulfur requirements and no DEF fluid. Number 15, as hard as it is for me to admit, bigger is not always better when it comes to the truck. 
Our truck may look big, but from bumper to the end of the spare tire is only 21 feet. Our living space is 13 feet long by six and a half feet wide. And choosing a small rig was the hardest thing for me to come to terms with. However, the benefits abound. This thing will fit in a parking space. It's easier to park than our F-150 at home. We can fit into ferry, vehicle ferry restrictions without any worry all around the world. This thing is really easy to drive in tiny cities that were built before vehicles existed. So, while bigger is more comfortable and in most cases better, it's not for this instance. You might wanna think about something a little more narrow and not quite as long so that you can get to places big vehicles can't get to. Moving on to number 16, tires. Yeah, you kind of need them. So what do you need to know about tires? Well, some vehicles take very specific sizes and those sizes may not be available everywhere. And bigger the tire, bigger the cost. Some of those big uh, military grade vehicles, those tires brand new can go over $2,000 each. And then some of those are even six by six. So you're not just buying four tires, but you're buying six tires. So we opted for a vehicle that takes standard 16 inch tires that are available around the world. All right, let's move on and talk about the camper or habitat, the place where you're gonna be living in your vehicle. That takes us to number 17, the walls, a really critical component of your build and probably not something most people give a lot of thought to right off the bat. However, it's the foundation for your living space and so something that needs to be given significant consideration. So what are your options? Number one are the walls you see on mainstream RVs. And we'll just suffice it to say they leave a lot to be desired. Then number two are the standard walls you see on sprinter vans or other vehicles that are manufactured. It's an okay option. They can be insulated, but again, not ideal. Then you move on to the choice that we have. It's a steel frame with aluminum siding and two inch insulation. It's decent. It does the job. We have a couple of issues. Number one is steel is susceptible to heat transfer or thermal transfer, whether it's heat or cold. So you get into a really cold environment like we do when we drive down the Alcan and it's minus 20 and anything that is bolted to this frame forms an ice ball. Our door forms a glacier. <laughs> and so this isn't a perfect option because it's also not the best choice for insulation. So that takes us to what is the best choice in modern times. If you're building in 2021, there is no reason to choose anything but composite walls. They used to be very expensive, very hard to come by, but now there are companies that actually produce composite walls to your specifications for your build at a very nominal price. So this is the best choice because you get the best insulation you have the most options for how you structure and build your rig and you can have the windows cut out of it and everything delivered right to your door for a really reasonable price. Welcome to the inside of our habitat for number 18 and we're going to talk about the interior height. I'm a six footer that gives us that's about six three inside here that is not very tall. So if you're looking at potential vehicles, you might want to ask like, hey, how tall is it inside? Because I know a lot of van life folks do it, but I don't want to spend my days hunched over like this. I don't know, we may be a little picky, like we don't want to deal with the rooftop tent stuff, but we're in this for the long haul and interior headroom is something you need to consider. Number 19, your windows. It's a really important consideration when factoring your build. Uh, we're big fans of these awning style windows. Historically, we've had the traditional slide windows that you see in American RVs. Uh, those limit how much air you can get in and out. Uh, you can't have them open when it's raining. 
And the awning style windows really have so many more options. They are double paned, so you're not gonna have the condensation issues with them. They are available in acrylic, which is more reasonably priced, or glass, which is more expensive. They have multiple settings, so you can leave them wide open like this and get lots of fresh air into your rig, the full size of the cutout in the side of your wall. You can also drop them down to vent setting or part way open. They also have screens, so you protect yourself from the bugs. Something to factor is whether the sides of the screens are sealed, so you protect yourself better from the bugs. They also have blackout and insulation features. Makes for sleeping a lot more comfortable, even if there's a big light outside your window. And they also help to keep you warmer, both with the insulation here and also the fact that they're double paned. So obviously we're big fans of these awning style windows, but uh, important factor in your build, something to really give a lot of consideration to. Next up when it comes to the habitat, number 20, the color of it. I'm not saying white is the best, but if you don't have white, you are going to know the difference because every shade of darker you get, the hotter the inside of this box gets when you're out on the road. And as novel as it may sound, I'm going to chase perfect weather. It does not always work that way. So you don't want to bring problems upon yourself. So until they come up with something better, white is the most ideal color for the exterior. Number 21, your subframe. And realistically, this is something you should spend some time Googling and researching. There are so many options, it's impossible for us to discuss them all. Sometimes your habitat is built straight onto the frame of your truck or chassis. And sometimes it's like ours, where it has a subframe that articulates separately from the chassis of the truck. This improves the abilities of the truck when you're off-road in particular, as it allows it to sway and move better uh, when you're on bumpy roads and navigating rough terrain. But suffice it to say, think about it, explore the options. Sometimes the subframes have springs, sometimes they're like ours with bump stop type features. You're gonna wanna give it some thought, spend some time deciding how you want your rig to be. For number 22, we're gonna start talking about electronics and your electrical system. So, Europe tends to have this thing called 220 volt, and the United States has 110 volt. They're two completely different uh, forms of electricity and appliances that work off of it. But one thing that does tend to be pretty universal is 12 volt electricity, which is what you have running through the camper so pretty much if you think about it like this anything that's running off of a battery is going to be 12 volt so you can have a 220 system or a 110 system and be able to get 12 volt stuff all around the world so just know where you're going and what you're going to have to deal with moving on to the next one 23 solar solar has come down a lot in price over the years it is staggering when we first got into this little hobby of RVing, it was going to be like ten to fifteen thousand dollars to put a pretty respectable system on our big class a motorhome it is not that anymore and also number 24 the batteries have come a long ways as well back when we started yeah they did have lithium batteries but it was not at a price point like they are at now you know, Battleborn, companies like that, they have changed the game. So these lithium batteries, they're like half the weight, almost twice the power. They are take up less space, more bang for the buck is what I'm trying to tell you. So know your electrical, your solar system, and your batteries. Moving right along, let's talk about climate control systems. So number 25, air conditioning, and number 26, heat. We're not just talking about the habitat either, but you gotta factor in the cab of your vehicle. Uh, our cab has air conditioning and heat. Our habitat has three forms of heat, no air conditioning yet, that's soon to be modified. When we were factoring and driving around the world, we wanted to be able to go slowly, 
embrace cultures, enjoy life, not race from the weather. So climate control is really important to us. In terms of the habitat of our truck and the heating system, we have three different heat sources. Our favorite one is this little Wallace stovetop heater here. It's a diesel stovetop heater. When you open it like this, it is a form of cooking uh, option. When you close it, a vent turns on and it blows heat out of the front. Not only does it blow heat out, but it also dehumidifies the air in our truck. And if you've lived in a, any kind of an RV, you know how critical it is to keep the moisture down in here. Moving over to our second heat source, this is our S-Bar Hydronic Heater. Controlled from your typical thermostat, just like any other kind of heating system. But we have lines that run through here, through our rig, with antifreeze. Uh, they're connected to our S-Bar heater in the back, underneath our bed. They're also connected to the engine in the front of the truck. So whether we're parked and we turn the S-Bar heater on or we're driving and we have the engine running, this habitat is being heated. Uh, it's a pretty amazing source of heat, great option, uh, really, really fantastic thought process and design when you think about how somebody put this all together. So let's talk about air conditioning next. Not something we currently have installed on our vehicle, but I'll tell you, speaking from experience right now, <laughs> a rooftop fan doesn't cut it. Now, the reason this truck doesn't have air conditioning is because when it was first built, it was solely powered by solar power. And at the point in time when this vehicle was built, it wasn't really an option to run an air conditioner with solar. It still isn't for long periods of time. And so realistically, just like you'll have to think about, we're thinking about power sources and likely going to install either a handheld generator or a traditional generator that you install on a vehicle to be able to power said air conditioner. When you factor the air conditioner itself, there are a couple of options. You can do the traditional rooftop mounted air conditioners like you see on traditional American RVs, or you could do a mini split air conditioner that's wall mounted. They also have 12 volt options, but they come at a very premium price. So we've kind of ruled them out. Honestly, it depends on what day you ask us whether we're gonna do a rooftop mounted or a wall mounted mini split right now. But one way or the other, this habitat is getting some air conditioning and we highly recommend it for your rig because when we bought this truck, the sole factor was to be able to slowly drive around the world embrace cultures, enjoy places, and not race from the weather. You're gonna to wanna to do the same thing. Whether it's hot or cold, you need to be able to control the climate inside your habitat and inside the cab of your truck. Well, our puppy Lucy is going to help us with number 27. She's been great. She's four months old and she's very well potty trained, but we still put these mats out as an insurance policy. Uh, first off, let's talk about the bed position. East-West versus North-South. Ours is East-West, like heads are here, feet are down there. If somebody wants out of the bed in the middle of the night, they either have to crawl over the person or the person has to get out. That's where a North-South bed is a little bit better because you could theoretically work your way on down the mattress and crawl yourself out without disturbing the other person. The cost of that is you're gonna take up more space because north-south is the longer dimension of the mattress. Speaking of mattresses, there's this thing in North America called RV Queens. They are like four inches shorter. So if you're a tall person, make sure you just give yourself a comfortable place to sleep. You know, theoretically you're there for anywhere from five to eight hours a night. That's Heck, if the weather sucks, sometimes you're in it a hell of a lot longer every day. But it is a very critical component, having a comfortable place to uh, chill out and lay your head. Another big problem when it comes to mattresses is mold that forms underneath them. We've gotten pretty lucky. This one was so well designed 
the water heater is actually underneath the bed. So this entire box is like got this radiant heat effect. So there are no cold spots. And a lot of times the cold spots are what cause that beer can effect. So yeah, everybody's seen a soda or a beer can on a hot day. Well, it sweats. That can happen the same under there. But good news is they make bed mats, which like are little ventilation systems that you can put under there that will help reduce the problem. But I'm very thankful that the people who designed our rig had the forethought to think like, hey, let's not deal with the mold problem in the first place. Well, oh, you're being a good girl. Just a few more talking points. We're almost there, Lucy. Almost there. Well, in my opinion, we saved one of the most important features for one of the last things we talk about, and that is storage. Uh, you may think that you can fit everything you need into a backpack, and for you, that is true. But if you're living out of a rig, the rig has needs too. So you need some storage space. And you have to factor, if you're traveling around the world, you're gonna need four seasons worth of clothing and supplies. We have an entire box that's full of nothing but off-season clothing and ski pants and heavy winter coats. Uh, the truck has needs too. You've got to have supplies to fix it, change tires, uh, take care of maintenance type things, spare parts, the list goes on. Uh, what good is a vehicle if, with a kitchen if you don't have a place to store the food? Hey, hey, we're out of toilet paper while we're in there. Can you grab some more, please? Okay. <laughs> so, as I was saying, storage is pretty critical. It's great to have a toilet, but you need somewhere to put the toilet paper. It's really nice to take a shower, but a hot water heater makes it a lot more comfortable. And it's wonderful to have a kitchen, but you gotta have pots and pans to cook with, spices to flavor your foods, and food to actually cook. And if you don't have a place to wash the dishes, well, life just gets a lot harder. So, when you're thinking about a place to live, storage should be paramount in how you design your rig. Number 30 is of critical importance because if you don't have one, you're always going to be looking for a toilet. Yes, we like to have our own toilet with us. Uh, just if you're on the road long enough, you don't want to have to have the hassle of always searching for a toilet when somebody needs to do their business. You just want to bring it with you. There's a few options. So the RVs, they have a toilet that just pumps water in and then it goes into this black tank that you have to take to an RV park or a campground or a dump station to get rid of the contents. It's a horrible pain because you actually have to find somewhere special. Another option, I'd like to test drive one myself, but they're composting toilets and I really like the appeal of them because you just put some moss in this bin where your poop goes, it stirs it around, it turns it into compost, the pee goes into this jug that you can just dump into the bushes every few days. So I do see the appeal in that. Another way a lot of people in vans do it is they have a simple porta potty from Walmart. It's the standalone self-contained unit that you just pop the top off and you can go dump it somewhere. We have what's called a cassette toilet, which is pretty much a glorified porta potty. And I say that because instead of like popping a tank off the top of the toilet it's all molded into the bathroom so all we gotta do is slide out this cassette and i just emptied it yesterday so that's as far as i'm gonna get but it is all self-contained right here and you can take that to a dump station and dump it or if you're in the wilds you could dig a hole there's a lot of options we also enjoy vault toilets because that long drop eliminates splashes and it's a big target uh, outhouses are a great place to dump them but yeah we have to empty this if it's the sole toilet that we're using every three days so that gets a little old as well but it's all compromises i know we said 30 but it ended up being 31 and if you've made it this far you must be digging what we have to say so here's a bonus number 31 the catchphrase single fuel source 
When you start looking at rigs like this, it's a phrase you're gonna see on the regular. And essentially what it means is that the vehicle runs off of the same type of fuel that all of your appliances inside of your habitat run off of. So our stove top runs off of the diesel, so does our S-bar heater, and so does the engine on our truck. Now, one exception that we may be looking at is a generator. As I talked about earlier, we're getting ready to install air conditioning. It's unrealistic probably to have a 12 volt one. It's also unrealistic to think that we can run the air conditioner as much as we potentially will need to solely off of battery power. We're looking at generators because of that. And finding a diesel generator just right for this rig is proving a little challenging. So we may go off the reservation here and end up with some gasoline on board. However, if you can get away from using propane, that's kind of the thing that is really ideal. Because as you travel around the world, different countries have different propane fittings and it can get to be a bit of a challenge. Plus, it's really easy just to pull up to the fuel pump, fill up your vehicle, and know that you've taken care of everything. You don't now have to go hunting for propane, which we used to do in our big class A motorhome. It can get to be a pain. So it's just simplifying things. Okay, that is a wrap for 31 things you need to know about building or buying the Ultimate Adventure Mobile. Beck, Lucy, and I are signing off. This little Mexican rescue puppy has been doing great. She's rolling with the punches, getting used to the camera, has her own YouTube channel. But that is a wrap. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope you found this video valuable and helpful. Thanks, guys. See you next time. We always like to thank our Outliers community for supporting production of these videos. You guys are the best. Click join on our YouTube channel for early releases, exclusive content, increased engagement, and so much more.